Good morning and welcome to worship. Would you please join me for an opening prayer? Oh, great God of the universe and Lord of our lives, thank you that your ways and your thoughts and your plans are so much bigger than what we can see or understand or know in this moment. We gather today as your people to wholeheartedly remember and offer our trust and our praise and our hope that is found in you. Send your spirit to be in our words, in our songs, in our prayers. Send your spirit to open our hearts and our ears and our minds so that we might find and know that message that you have for each of us today so that we can go out in faith living as people who are a part of this wonderful plan and painting that you have already created. Oh God, we love you. Bless our worship. Amen. The boy grew up and stopped nursing. On the day he stopped nursing, Abraham prepared a huge banquet. Sarah saw Hagar's son laughing, the one Hagar the Egyptian had borne to Abraham. So she said to Abraham, Send this servant away with her son. The servant's son won't share the inheritance with my son Isaac. This upset Abraham terribly because the boy was his son. God said to Abraham, Don't be upset about the boy and your servant. Do everything Sarah tells you to do because your descendants will be traced through Isaac. But I will make of your servant son a great nation too, because he is also your descendant. Abraham got up early in the morning, took some bread and a flask of water, and gave it to Hagar. 
put the boy in her shoulder sling and sent her away. She left and wandered through the desert, near Beersheba. Finally, the water in the flask ran out, and she put the boy down under one of the desert shrubs. She walked away from him about as far as a bow shot and sat down telling herself, I can't bear to see the boy die. She sat at a distance, cried out in grief, and wept. God heard the boy's cries, and God's messenger called Hagar to Hagar from heaven and said to her, Hagar, what's wrong? Don't be afraid. God has heard the boy's cries over there. Get up, pick up the boy, and take him by the hand. I will make of him a great nation. Then God opened her eyes, and she saw a well. She went over, filled the water flask, and gave the boy a drink. God remained with the boy. He grew up, lived in the desert, and became an expert archer. He lived in the Paran Desert, and his mother found him an Egyptian wife. This week, I watched a Netflix comedy stand-up special where the comedian began her show by telling the audience what her whole plan for the show was. She told them what jokes to expect. She told them about the theme. She even told them to look out for a particular joke that she was really proud of. She clued them in on the big reveal at the center of her show, and it was all very funny. And true to her word, all of the themes and the jokes and the big reveals were in there. The book of Genesis is where the story begins in our scriptures. And if you look closely, there's so much revealed in that book about how the story will unfold. So many of the themes and promises of God's relationship with us and to us are right there in those first stories. And Genesis is naturally a book of firsts. Sarah is the first matriarch. She is the first in a long line of wanderers and wonders and faithful and doubtful people of God. Hagar is the first person in the Bible, not the first woman, the first person to be visited by a divine messenger of God. She's the only person in the Bible who ever names God, gives God a name. She's the first person to receive the promise of descendants. She is the mother of the first of Abraham's children. Their story, Sarah and Hagar's, is the first of many stories like it, stories that continue even today. Here's what happened. Abraham... Sarah's husband, was given a promise by God that he would have descendants that outnumbered the stars in the sky. The problem was Sarah was old and they had no children. Sarah was unsure and worried about how this thing could happen. So she told Hagar, who was her servant, to sleep with Abraham so that Hagar could become pregnant and give Abraham the descendants that God had promised him. It's important to note that this was Sarah's idea, not Hagar's choice. So all of this goes down according to Sarah's plan, but when Hagar becomes pregnant, Sarah begins to mistreat her. It gets so bad that Hagar runs away. 
So Hagar, alone and pregnant and in the desert, is sitting by a spring of water when a divine messenger comes to her and tells her to go back to Sarah because God intends to make her son, Hagar's son, the father of a great people. Then Hagar names God Elroy, which means God sees me. So Hagar returns and gives birth to a son who's named Ishmael, which is the name the divine messenger gives to Hagar for her son while she's in the desert. And after Hagar's return, visitors announce Sarah's impending pregnancy, which pretty much leads us to the scripture for today. So Sarah has given birth to Isaac, and he's beginning to grow. And one day, Sarah notices Ishmael doing something with Isaac. There's been much debate over what that something is. Perhaps he's playing with him. Perhaps he's teasing him. Perhaps he's imitating him. Whatever it was, it enrages Sarah to the point that she demands that Hagar and Ishmael be sent out into the wilderness. That boy will not inherit along with my son, is what she says. See, Ishmael was the firstborn son, and as the firstborn son, he was entitled to a double portion of the inheritance. He would be the one with pride of place among all of the sons of Abraham. Of all these descendants that God had promised, Ishmael would be the first. As Sarah saw it, if Ishmael was around, there was no place for Isaac. It was one or the other, my son or your son, me or you. It's one of the recurring themes we humans just can't seem to figure out how to let go of. The idea that life is a zero-sum game. In order for me to have something, you cannot have that thing. Whatever you have is something that has been taken away from me. That was the world as Sarah saw it. And operating in that world, it makes sense that she did what she did. She was protecting her son, providing him with what he needed. If the only choice is I win, you lose, or you win, I lose, then of course she would do what she did. What she didn't know, what she couldn't see, what she couldn't imagine, was that God had something else in mind. God had in mind a future for both of the sons. From the beginning of the story, if you're paying close attention, you will notice that God made promises to both of them, promises that they would both have sons who would be the firstborn of great nations. And they did. This too is one of the recurring themes in the unfolding story of God and us. Probably it is the theme, the main theme, the big reveal. From the very beginning of the story, God created a we world. Not a we world, a we world. A world where blessing, goodness, grace is meant for all, not just for some. That's the kingdom that God envisions and Jesus proclaims. The kingdom that God asks us to co-create and co-build. But it only works when it works for all of us. Because there is no such thing as I win, we lose. If we lose, then I lose too. I want to live in a community where everyone can be healthy and whole. But as long as some people can't afford to go to the doctor or have access to medications they need, we cannot be the community we hope for. We want to live in a world where people aren't afraid, where violence doesn't happen. But as long as abuse happens in secret or violence to others is excused or pushed under the rug, we do not live in that world. 
We hold dear the idea that all lives are valued and valuable, but until Black lives matter, both as words that we say and through the actions we take, it is not true that all lives matter. This moment we're living in now, this is a crucial moment in our lives together and in our story as people of God. Too long, we've been living with an inheritance that depended on others being cast out into the wilderness. Too long, we've been subscribe, subscribing to this I win, we lose mentality that God has rejected over and over and over and over. And I know that this, this was not completely a mess of our own making. Sarah would say it was not a mess of her own making either. She didn't set up the system that she was living in, the system where wealth is measured by sons and some get everything and some are sent to the wilderness. But that's not a good enough answer. It wasn't for Sarah and it isn't for us. Not when God has something else in mind for us. Not when we're given the chance to make a different decision, to choose a different path, to dream a different dream, to do better. We've been talking a lot these days about listening and learning. And that is so important right now, to listen to the voices that have been too long in the wilderness, to learn about how it got to be that way. But here and now, we can also start the work of acting out of a different mentality, of making different choices, of imagining different things, of trying to build with God a different future, and not only a different future, a different present. As you do, as we do, I want to offer the, you these words from a Black woman who is a poet and artist, Morgan Harper Nichols. Engage in the long, faithful work. Surrender the need of striving to be the best or always right, and focus instead on leaning into light that reveals all things, all that is good and all that stands to be corrected and redirected. And as you lean into light, be gentle with the word darkness, for more than it merely means wrong or bad, it is also the color of a full starless night sky and actual bodies of human beings who have been overlooked too many times. Many, many words hold more than one meaning. Language on light and dark may have its place, and this is also true. This very language has been used to say, you are a threat, I am not. I am worth more than you. It takes kindness to understand this. For even though kindness is a beautiful word, it does not mean that nothing gets disrupted. Sometimes a way of thinking must be interrupted in order for kindness to truly thrive. For as sure as kindness leans into what is good, it also speaks about what isn't right. It is compassionate and gentle when long histories are pulled from morning into morning. Engage in the long, faithful work of awakening with your heart and mind open to the possibility that things are more complex than they once seemed. And as hard as it is to hold all of this, you are still free to dream. You do not have to be who you used to be. You do not have to think the way that you used to think. You are free to take hopeful, thoughtful action in pursuit of better things. So here's to new beginnings. Knowing it is impossible to ignore that long history. Opening up to the mystery that grace still finds you here. And grace is unmerited favor, but it might not always look the way you want it to. It will invite you out in the open, and it will also reveal what has been broken. You might have to unlearn the way you thought things would be. 
You might find that being undone is the best way to move on, humbly, mindfully, wholly. For how liberating it is to pursue wholeness over perfection, finding that grace is more than a beautiful word, but a daily act of being undone and awakening a direction. Thanks be to God. Amen. It is the day in which we get to celebrate all the important men in our lives, dads and grandpas and uncles and teachers and mentors and pastors and coaches and neighbors, all the men in our lives who have made an impact on us. And so we want to say Happy Father's Day to you. And as a special way to celebrate you, we bring to you this uh, photo collage that was put together by Pastor Angie. Happy Father's Day, please enjoy. And now comes the time in our service where we get to come to the table for the Lord's Supper. You know, one of my favorite things about being Methodist is that all people are welcome to the table of Christ. You don't have to be Methodist. You don't have to believe a certain thing or vow a certain thing. There are not all of these loopholes and hoops to jump through. We are all welcome as children of God. And so as Pastor Sarah said this morning in her sermon, we get to enter in to the Lord's Supper this, this morning together as a part of the big grand narrative that God is painting for us. We are part of a story that is a part of an even bigger story. And so this morning, I would ask as you get your communion elements ready to prepare your hearts for partaking in the cup of hope 
and the bread of life. On the night that our Savior Jesus was to give himself up for love, he took bread with his disciples, gave thanks to God, broke it, and said, This is my body, broken for you. Whenever you eat, do so in remembrance of me. And after the supper, Christ took the cup, gave thanks to God, and said to the disciples, This cup is the cup of the new covenant, poured out for the forgiveness of sins and the restoration of the world. Every time you drink of this cup, do so in remembrance of me. And now I would ask that you pray with me this morning as we bless our elements for communion. Gracious and loving God, we ask that you would pour out your Holy Spirit on this common bread and vine. Make them be for us the cup of hope and the bread of new life. And may these elements nourish and sustain us with your grace, Lord, that we might be transformed to go out in the world and bring your love. In Jesus' name, amen. And now we have a special treat where we are going to hear the Lord's Prayer sung this morning. May our hearts be renewed by the sacred music. Amen. Oh! 